Hello everyone. Today's lesson is called Distant Starlight, Not a Problem for a Young Universe. Today's outline will review the biblical age of the universe. We'll have de definitions on the speed of light and light year. We'll address six light travel time assumptions, like the Big Bang does not have a light travel time problem when it does, and they say biblical creation does. The speed of light is constant through space. Another one, light traveled the entire distance. The next, light always traveled as it does today. Another assumption, we know light's one-way speed. And the last one, universe has no center of mass. Now some of them you might understand, and one or two may be a brain scratcher, but we'll get through this. Using a lot of information from the video called Light Years No Problem from Dr. Russell Humphreys, and that's at creation.com. Another video, Astronomy Re Reveals Creation from D Dr. Jason Lyle. And the third is Evolution Achilles Heels by Creation Ministries International. First of all, let's answer the question, how old is the universe based on the Bible? The Bible teaches, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth in Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 14 through 16 talks about the stars. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs to indicate seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So that's the key verse 15 showing that God brought the light so Adam and Eve could see it. And that'll be key later on. Verse 16, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Genesis 1.31, God saw everything he made and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So that says that the creation took six days. Also, Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So there's your evidence for the Bible teaching. It took six days for God to make the heavens and the earth. But we can go further. We can see how old the earth is by the genealogies. Genesis 5, 3. And Adam lived 130 years and got a son. He called his name Seth. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. And Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. So with all the ge genealogies in the Bible, you can add them up and to get a total of how many years uh, the Bible is. So here is 2,000 years B.C. If you add them all up, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, and so forth. And you can get to Abraham about 2,000 years. Also, the genealogies go from Adam to Christ through the line of Mary and the line of Joseph. So to estimate the age of the universe based on the Bible, we had five days before Adam, from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years, and from Abraham until today, 4,000 years. So the total age of the universe from the Bible is about 6,000 years. Now let's get into the definitions. First, the speed of light. The speed of light is the light that travels at 186,282 miles a second. And that's very fast. That's faster than any vehicle can go. And that, But that assumes a two-way, round-trip, average speed of light. We do not know the one-way speed of light, and I'll get into that in details later. A light year is the distant light travels in one year. So if you calculate 186,000 miles a second into a year, that turns into nearly 6 trillion miles in one light year. But the light year distance also assumes a two-way average speed of light. So the light from distant objects. How does the light get here? Well, it travels through space. And does this process take some time? And can we calculate how long it takes a beam of light to reach Earth? Well, Dr. Russell Humphreys has an introductory uh, clip on light years. 
creationists have lots of scientific evidence that the world is very young, thousands of years, not billions. But the problem that many people perceive is that many galaxies are billions of light years away from us. And a light year, by the way, is a distance unit. It's six trillion miles. But it would take uh, billions of years normally for that light to get to us. And if the world is only thousands of years old, the question is, how can we see so much of a really big universe? The biggest thing we need to explain is how starlight got here fast within the thousands of years that the Bible gives us and that the rest of the evidence gives us. So the light travel time from distant objects. We'll use this basic formula. Light travel time equals distance divided by speed. Using this calculation, we see galaxies that are apparently farther than 6,000 light years away. For example, the galaxy we see here on the right is the Andromeda galaxy, and it is 2.5 million light years away. Some galaxies are even further. Like a picture here, these galaxies are as far as 13.2 billion light years away. So indicating billions of light years to get here. Well, this seems like a straightforward argument and calculation. And in fact, the atheist website, the Rational Wiki, talks about the starlight problem. And that's the atheist's favorite arguments against the Genesis account of creation. And some professing Christians use this argument for an old earth as well. Dr. Norman Geisler, anybody hear of him? I see a couple in the audience, good. He's an example of a professing Christian who denies Genesis as history. And he wrote this, I think the speed of light is the crucial thing. If you could prove that the speed of light changes, you'd probably convert me to a young earth creationist. And another professing Christian, Dr. William Lane Craig, wrote this, The scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports the idea that the earth is very ancient. And he also said, when you think that we can see stars, that very simple fact that you can see these stars billions of light years away shows how ancient the universe is. We also have a video clip of William Lane Craig. He's the research professor of philosophy at the Talbert, Talbert School of Theology in La Mirada, California. And remember, he is teaching uh, future pastors, future church leaders, and here's what he has to say. How old is the world? So best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good. You see, I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, yeah. that, that is not a tenable position. I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. So there you go. He's not bucking up against mainstream science. He's going with the flow. So let's look at the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Could Adam actually see it? Like I mentioned, it's the closest star to Earth next to the sun. It's about 4.2 light years away. So did Adam have to wait four years to see his first star? Well, of course not, because Genesis 1.15 teaches Adam was able to see stars right away. And it states, let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. So the light travel time issue is not just for distant stars, it's also for close stars as well. Okay, we're going to use this acronym, LTT. It stands for Light Travel Time. And it means how long did the light take to travel from out there to here? And the atheist response is, due to this LTT problem, light travel time, the Bible's disproved and the Big Bang model confirmed, they'll say, because this is a straightforward argument for my side. The Christian response could be, no, it is not, because the LTT calculation includes many assumptions. 
So there's our formula we're going to use for today's lesson. Time equals distance divided by speed. And as I mentioned, we're going to address six light travel time assumptions. The very first one, the assumption is out there that the Big Bang does not have a light tra travel time problem it, when it actually does. The edge of the universe is 13.7 billion light years away from Earth in all directions. So you go from one edge of the universe to the other, it's 13 point billion years to the southwest of Earth and 13.7 billion years to the northeast of Earth. If you add them both up, the light should take 27.4 billion years to reach the opposite sides of the universe. Since the universe, according to the Big Bang, is 13.7 billion years old, therefore there has not been enough time for light to travel to the opposite sides of the universe yet. See how that makes sense? Not only does the Big Bang have a light travel time problem, it also has a horizon problem. The cosmic microwave background, I talked about this last week, shows that the entire universe has basically the same temperature and the CMB only varies by plus or minus 200 microkelvins. And microkelvin is 10 to the minus 6 power. So it's a very small number. Therefore, the entire universe is nearly the same temperature. And there has not been enough time for light and heat energy to travel from one side of the universe to the other. If the opposite sides of the universe have not been able to exchange energy yet, they should not be the same temperature today. Make sense? We'll go through several videos consecutively by PhD scientists who talk about the Big Bang's horizon and light time travel problems. Here is Dr. Jim Mason. Many people uh, say that creationists have a, an issue with light travel. That is, how can we see light from distant stars when the Earth is only 6,000 years old? But the Big Bang, in fact, has its own light travel problem. This has to do with the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is supposedly the afterglow of the Big Bang, and, and which has been observed to have a very uniform temperature no matter where you look in space. And there just hasn't been enough time for the energy to be transferred across space to make all this temperature uniform to the extent that it is. And that's called the horizon problem. So there you go. I hate to summarize what I said. Also, Dr. Jason Lau will talk about the Big Bang's LTT problem. The Big Bang, the alternative to biblical creation, also has a similar type of problem, a light travel time problem of its own. It's called the horizon problem. And basically it has to do with the cosmic microwave background that we see uh, streaming from the distant regions of the universe. We find that it's very uniform. And that shouldn't be because in the Big Bang model, uh, it should have different temperatures at different places. Why is it so uniform? Obviously light energy had to travel from the, the hotter regions to the cooler regions to equilibrate those temperatures. But there hasn't been enough time. Even in 13.7 billion years, there's not enough time for light to travel from one side of the visible universe to the other. And so that's a light travel time problem for the Big Bang. It seems to me that if the alternative to biblical creation has the same type of problem as biblical creation, then you can't argue that distant starlight somehow disproves biblical creation in favor of the Big Bang. And after all, God is omniscient. He could have used a mechanism that we do know about, or he could have used a mechanism that we don't know about. But it's not a problem for an infinite God to get light from distant galaxies to Earth in thousands of years. Okay. We now we have another Ph.D. scientist who will talk about the term inflation. And inflation, we talked about this last week, is Big Bang's rescuing device. It's an invented thing to try to get the starlight from one side of the universe to another, and he'll talk about this. There was an interesting uh, explanation or um, uh, attempt to, uh, to, to find a solution to this, and it's called the inflationary period. So some incredibly short instant after this initial Big Bang, the universe expanded by massive orders of magnitude, and then somehow this, this uh, period of inflation, as it's called, stopped. So it starts for no particular reason, and it stops for no particular reason. And by the way, during it, gravity has to work in reverse. So rather than matter being attracted to matter, it has to repel it. And so there's this amazing story is told to try and patch up this glaring problem that the Big Bang has. Okay, 
we have another Ph.D. scientist, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, and he'll talk about the inflation versus God stretching the universe because the Bible says in 17 different places about God stretching the universe. Inflation proponents have no good physical model for this faster than light expansion. It's a fudge factor. But the Bible teaches several times that God stretched out the heavens. The uniformity of background temperature is consistent with the universe being upheld by a single creator outside time and space. Furthermore, it's not just a God did it explanation. Creationist physicists have developed multiple competing models of this expansion using Einsteinian general relativity. So inflation. Inflation is actually outside of physics. As these secular scientists say, what drove inflation? Nobody knows. Physicists have suggested different models to describe the inflating universe, but all the solutions are mathematical conveniences with no particular physical basis. All the theories of inflation amount to proof that we don't have one good theory yet. Another writes, Inflation's theoretical underpinning may be rather tentative. The inflaton, after all, is a hypothetical field, that means they made it up, whose existence has yet to be demonstrated. Its potential energy curve is posited by researchers, not revealed by observation. The inflation must somehow start at the top of its energy curve across the region of space, and so on. The, uh, one of the authors in this publication actually came up with inflation, and this is what they write. Inflation is exponentially unlikely. The models most favored by their data, combined with earlier results, suffer from exacerbated forms of initial conditions and multiverse problems. Remember, we talked about the multiverse last week. And they create a new difficulty that we call the inflationary unlikeliness problem. That is, the favored inflation potentials are exponentially unlikely according to the logic of in the inflationary paradigm itself. So what do we call something that is, outside of physics, hypothetical process, a hypothetical particle that has never been seen, and what do we call something that is exponentially unlikely according to its own logic? We call it a miracle. So Big Bang's LTT problem using inflation can only be solved by invoking a miracle. The next number two light travel time assumption. The speed of light is constant through space. For our formula, we're going to look at the speed part. The question, speed of light, where have we measured it? Well, all of our measurements throughout history have been taken within our solar system. We never have been outside of our solar system. And we don't know the speed of light outside of the solar system. So therefore, the speed of light, could it be different outside the solar system? Because in the solar system, we are heavily influenced by the gravitational field of our sun. The farther outside the gravitational field, the faster the light might travel. Therefore, between the stars, light could travel faster. What about deep space? Is the speed of light the same? If you look at this picture, there are large areas of open space between the galaxies. If you are far away from any star, could light travel faster in open deep space? We don't know, and we never measured it, because we never measured the speed of light outside our own solar system. We only assume it's the same, which is only an assumption. So, deep space, speed of light faster? If light travels faster in deep space, the speed value goes up, which means then it would arrive here in a much shorter time. With speed going up, that means time would go down in our formula. Therefore, it would not be a straightforward calculation. This is an assumption that the calculation relies on. The third LTT assumption is that light traveled the entire distance. Here we're looking at the distance portion of our, our calculation or formula. So what about a mature creation? 
God's creation was mature. Did Adam wake up next to a pile of seeds or pits? Or did he wake up next to mature fruit trees? Did Adam wake up as an infant or an adult male? Well, obviously the trees were mature and Adam was an adult male or mature. So some of the creation was mature at the beginning. What about mature stars? Well, at least one star had to be created mature, which was our sun, to give heat and light and energy to our planet. Nuclear fusion deep within the sun provides photons. Photons arrive on Earth as sunlight, but not right away. Sector scientists believe that photons take thousands of years to work their way to the sun's surface. So based on that, could Adam even see the sun when he awoke? Now let's go further out. What about mature stars? God had to create the sun's light, maybe in transit. So the sun's light uh, would not be able to reach Adam if it had to wait thousands of years for those photons. Therefore, God could have brought all the starlight in the heavens to earth during his creation. This would provide an appearance of age with starlight. Here's an example of the starlight coming to earth having an appearance of age. We have an example. What about Eve? If you look at Eve's created hair, it's made of little platelets of proteins. By looking at someone's hair, you can determine his or her nutritional history. So if you could have plucked a hair from Eve's head, um, we would have seen a history that never happened. Eve must have looked older than her one day of life, so the plants growing must have looked like they have been growing for years. So God created this world already functioning, and this is a creation out of nothing. So mature creation or appearance of age is one possible answer. The fourth light travel time assumption is light always traveled as it does today. We're going to address the speed issue. So in Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12, we read, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass an herb yielding seed after his kind, and a tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So the term bring forth and brought forth could be interpreted as an accelerated process. You know, sometimes we think that God just snapped his fingers and said, let there be grass, and poof, it popped into place. But that's not what the Bible seems to be teaching. Let the earth bring forth grass, and then the earth brought forth grass and there's a term in the hebrew called dasha which could be an accelerated process so bring forth and implies an accelerated process where plants grew potentially an accelerated process in a short time and this is demonstrated in the movie genesis paradise lost where it shows plants being accelerated during the creation time frame let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so.
So starlight travel could have been accelerated as well. For example, God may have said, let the stars bring forth light, accelerate their speed to here. Now, it doesn't say that he did that, but the word dasha makes it intriguing, especially if it applied across the creation. This would address the light time travel problem, increase the speed and decrease the time to get here. The fifth assumption, we know light's one-way speed. Is there anybody in the audience that has ever heard of Dr. Jason Lyle's anisotropic synchrony convention? See, just one. This is, we don't know the one-way speed. We know the two-way speed, and that's what the assumption is for the calculation of speed of light. But he'll get into the reason why we don't know the one-way speed. And for our formula, we're going to focus on the speed part of the calculation. This ties to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein stated that it is impossible to know the one-way speed of light. We can only know the two-way speed. He wrote in his uh, Relativity Special and General Theory, he said, The light requires the same time to traverse the path from A to M as for the path B to M. M is in the middle, so A and B are on the opposite sides. So he said, this is in reality neither a supposition nor a hip hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will. Note, you are free to choose the one-way sp speed that you want. You probably haven't heard that out in the uh, secular media, have you? So he's saying the one-way light speed you choose. But the basic assumption today is the one-way speed and the two-way speed of light are the same. But Einstein stated that you are free to choose any one-way speed of light because it can never be measured and it can never be known. In fact, it's even improper to ask the question. You can choose, for example, an infinite speed of light coming to Earth if you want. So that means light takes zero seconds getting to Earth as long as the return light speed takes twice as long to compensate for the average two-way light speed. See how that works? The two-way light speed has to take the normal time, but the one-way could be we could choose anything we want. Therefore, this invalidates the light time travel issue. And Dr. Jason Lyle, this goes about seven minutes he'll talk about this at length one way speed of light you've heard that the speed of light is constant in a vacuum perhaps that's true but that's a round trip speed in other words if i measured the speed of light on a round trip I, I have a flashlight let's say we construct a very long hallway and in one end we put a flashlight and then the, the hallway is 186,000 miles long we'll, we'll put a mirror on the other end of it and when the clock strikes noon, we'll, we'll send out that light pulse, and of course it bounces off the mirror. And then when I see the return trip, um, I, I look at the clock, and I find that you would find that two seconds have elapsed. Light takes two seconds to go down that hallway, bounce off the mirror, and come back. That's a round trip. It goes there and back. Most people assume it took one second to go out and one second to come back. But in fact, we don't really know that. It could be the case, for example, that the light um, zips out quickly, maybe, maybe taking no time at all to get to the mirror, and it takes all of two seconds to come back. It could see, we'd see the same thing, because I'm standing over here by the, by the flashlight with my clock. I emit it at the same time, and I see the return trip at the same You can't tell. Or it could be the opposite. It could be that the light takes a long time to get out to the mirror, and then it travels back very slowly. And people say, well, why would they be different? And I don't really know, but I don't know why they would be the same either. 
um, this direction and this direction are not the same direction. And there are, there are certain crystals where the speed of light is very different in one direction than another, just due to the way that the crystals aligned and so on. It could be that the vacuum of space is that way. It could be that light propagates through space this way at a different speed than that way. The point is we don't know. All we know is the round trip speed. You say, well, fine, we'll just measure the one-way speed of light. How are you going to do that? It turns out it's hard. Really hard. We'll try, in order to do the one-way speed of light, you can't use a mirror anymore because we ju we're going to do just a one-way trip. So you have one clock over here, one clock over there. You send the pulse out. When this one hits noon, and it hits there, and you read the time. And you're thinking it's probably one second after 12, right? Well, I tried this in my office. I did. My watch hit noon. As soon as it hit noon, I turned on the light just for a split second. And as soon as I saw the reflection off the phone, I got a clock over there by my phone. And as soon as I saw the reflection of that, I read the time. It said 12.05, and I said, uh-huh, light takes five minutes to get from my, what, oh no, you don't believe me? Did I make an assumption that maybe is not correct? See, this kind of experiment would only work if these clocks are synchronized. Now, it happens that the clock on my desk is five minutes fast, you see, and so of course I'm going to get the wrong answer. And since we're dealing with light, something that's very fast, these two clocks have to be exactly synchronized. You say, no problem, we'll just synchronize clocks that are separated by distance. Turns out that can't be done. Let me show you why. Most people, most of the time we use a radio transmitter to synchronize clocks, at least approximately. But the problem is, you know, so there's a radio transmitter station in Fort Collins. In fact, my watch sets it to that. It receives a radio pulse and resets it to get the exact time every night. It's kind of neat. Never have to set it that way. Um, but the radio pulse takes a little bit of time to get from one clock to the other, doesn't it? Well, and so if, if, I, if, if when this one hits noon, you send out the radio pulse, or, or then it goes over to the other one and it receives it. Um, okay, you, st you set it to noon, but wait a minute, it took a little bit of time. Should I set it maybe a little bit forward of noon? How far forward? Well, how long does it take the radio pulse to travel? The problem is radio travels at the speed of light. <laughs> and that's the very thing I'm trying to measure. <laughs> Can't be done. Some people have thought if you put the radio transmitter in the middle, that'll solve it, but it really doesn't. Because if, if light travels different speeds in different directions, then so does radio. And so the clocks would not be synchronized under that condition. Some people have said, well, we'll synchronize the clocks when they're together, and then we'll move one of them, or both of them, to the opposite ends of the hallway. And that seems really good, because it's no problem synchronizing when they're together. You can see they read the same time. But there's a problem. Motion affects the passage of time. According to Einstein, the very act of moving a clock causes it to become desynchronized. Now, the good news is there's an equation that tells you how much it's desynchronized. And so you could compensate for it, set it back. The bad news is, in that equation, is the speed of light. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's like God doesn't want us to know the one-way speed of light. It's really interesting. So apparently, it's impossible to synchronize clocks without knowing the one-way speed of light. And it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light without synchronized clocks. We're, just, we're stuck in a permanent catch-22. And I'm going to suggest that that means that this one-way speed of light is not actually a property of nature. It's, it's a convention, something that we get to make up. And that's counterintuitive. Because people are inclined to think, well, there, it's got a speed. We, if only God would whisper into our ear what it is. And I'm saying, no, it actually doesn't have, it's got a round trip speed that God sets. We get to choose the one-way speed, amazingly. And uh, I'm not the first to come up with that idea. The first to come up with the idea that the uh, speed of light being different or the same in different directions is something we get to choose and is in fact not a, uh, say, is not a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. The person who came up with that was Albert Einstein. He realized that it's, that it's impossible to synchronize two clocks um, except by choosing the one-way speed of light, what you want it to be. And what that means is I can choose the one-way speed of light if I want to, to be infinitely quick when it's toward me as long as the return trip averages to C, which would be half, half C when it goes out. And it all works out. The, math, the physics all works out. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but we're, um, I'm, getting, I'm actually out of time here, so I need to wrap things up. But my point is, if we use this convention, the distance starlight problem is solved. Because the light doesn't have to go out to the galaxies and return. That would take billions of years. It only has to go one way. And that doesn't take any time at all. If, you, if the Bible uses this, what's called an anisotropic synchrony convention. Anisotropic means different in different directions. And if the Bible uses this anisotropic or ask synchrony convention, 
then there is no distant starlight problem. God makes, makes the stars on day four and their light arrives on earth instantaneously, even today. So you're seeing the universe in real time if you choose this convention. The only issue is, does the Bible use that convention? And I think it does. One, it's the convention that all ancient cultures implicitly used. Two, I think it's suggested by scripture in Genesis 1, 14 and 1, 15. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the light. Let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years. And then he says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it says, and it was so. What was so? They gave light on the earth. Apparently, when God first spoke those stars into existence, they immediately began fulfilling their God-ordained role to give light upon the earth. It didn't take any time at all, and that implies the Ask Convention. So I think the scriptures are using that particular system. I don't think they're using Einstein's system, which wasn't invented until really the 20th century, but implicitly a little bit before then. I might be wrong about that, but it's a, it's a good model, and nobody's been able to refute it so far. And uh, we, we do have answers. That's the point I want you to understand. We do have answers. There you go. So the one-way light speed is actually arbitrary. We can stipulate whatever one-way speed that we want, as Jason Lau mentioned. The LTT issue requires the speed of light to be absolute, not arbitrary. The relativity states it's an arbitrary choice, not an absolute number. Therefore, the LTT issue is not a valid challenge. The problem itself is invalid because it requires something to be absolute, but it's not. So the sixth light tra travel time assumption is the universe has no center of mass. When we'll show we're in the center of the universe based on observational science. And if you're in the center of the universe, then you can incorporate what's called gravitational time dilation. This time in our formula, we're going to look at time. Remember last week we talked about red-shifted light? Well, red-shifted light means the star is moving away from you. Blue-shifted light means the star is moving towards you. And I mentioned last week it's similar to Doppler radar. Now, all distance galaxies in the universe are moving away from Earth or red-shifted. And the farther we look, the faster everything is traveling. And this is what the Big Bang used or adopted after it was found that the universe was expanding. The Big Bang did not forecast this. It was already in place before the Big Bang Theory came out and they adopted this concept. But there are other cosmogonies that describe the redshift. The Bible describes this. It appears that we are at the center of the expansion. But there are two possibilities. The Big Bang um, model they say we appear to be at the center of expanding universe because it would look that way from everywhere. The creation possibilities, we appear to be at the center of expanding universe because we actually are at the center. Secular scientists only use option one and refuse to consider option two. Why? Well, has anyone heard of Edwin Hubble? I see a lot of people. Dis he discovered the expanding universe, and this is what he wrote. The unwelcome supposition of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. A favored position, of course, is intolerable. Therefore, in order to restore homogeneity and to escape the horror of a unique position, the departures from uniformity must be compensated. There seems to be no other escape. Look what he said, the horror of a unique position. So notes, Hubble recognized being at the center of the universe has implications. One, being at the center of the universe means it's a special place. Two, we appear to be there. So it makes us special and points to a creator. And he called that unwelcome, must avoid, intolerable, and the horror of a unique position. He goes on, if we see the nebula all receding from our position in space, then Every other observer, no matter where he may be located, will see the nebula all receding from his position. However, the assumption is adopted. There must be no favored location in the universe. No center, no boundary. All must see the universe alike. So he adopted this 
cosmo cosmology cosmological Copernican principle, or the idea the universe can have no center. This is the foundational assumption of the Big Bang model. And they had to make a decision before you apply any math equations to make a cosmological model. So the Big Bang model The Big Bang model, based on anti-theistic assumption, is a denial of us being in a favored location in the universe. He said the horror of a unique position. So Christians need to be aware of this concept because the Big Bang is an anti-theistic assumption. Now we'll transition. Looking at the Bible closer, Genesis 1 verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the earth being formless and void within the deep, the deep was, could be considered a big ball of water, bigger than earth, very different from the Big Bang model. The Bible says water, the Big Bang says plasma. And I'll show two videos, one where Dr. Russell Humphreys talks about the deep was a ball of water. The fact that the waters have a face, a surface, uh, if you put a blob of water out in a total vacuum and there's no gravity, uh, it's going to be very fuzzy, lots of mists, uh, there won't be a surface. But the fact that there's a face, face of the deep, face of the waters, means that there's gravity at work. So this tells us something else, uh, that the deep was a big ball of water. And uh, so because gravity would pull uh, the water into a sphere surface. The fact that the waters have... And Dr. Russell Humphreys will compare water versus Big Bang's plasma. This is quite different from the Big Bang theory. The deep is, uh, is dark to begin with. The Big Bang starts with a big flash of light. And it doesn't start with water. It starts with plasma. In the Big Bang theory, the Earth doesn't come along until 10 billion years after the Big Bang. Here, we have the Earth formless and featureless right within the deep. And then he also goes and talks about the waters above and the earth being the center of the universe, using Genesis 1 as, as a guide. Uh, 1 6 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. So note expanse and note midst. Uh, what's an expanse? In Hebrew, the word is rakia. In the Greek Septuagint, it's stereoma. In the Latin Vulgate, it's firmamentum, and the King James translators got their word firmament from firmamentum. But all these words mean something that is spread out. So there's a something spread out, and notice he's starting it in the midst of the waters. Somewhere down at the midst, I can't show it real small, uh, he made a space, a little demarcation. And then uh, the waters above the expanse moved outward, and the expanse expanded. And right now, I think uh, the waters above the expanse are at least 14 billion light years above us. So what the Bible says is beyond the stars is water. By the way, he, God called the expanse heaven. So there's no mistaking what he meant by the expanse. It's a big, empty space where the stars are going to be. I know that there are waters above, partly because of Psalm 148, verse 4, which reads, Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. So the earth is near the center of this configuration. And how do we know that? Because remember, when he made the expanse, he made it near the center of or the midst of the ball of water. There happens to be some evidence that I've discussed in the Creation Ex Nihilo Technical Journal, now called Journal of Creation. And the evidence is called quantized redshifts. And that indicates that the Earth and our galaxy are pretty near the center of the universe. 
So there's some physical evidence that bears the statement from Scripture out. So there's a person called George Francis Raymer Ellis as a high-profile cosmologist who has co-authored papers with the late Big Bang guru Stephen Hawking. In a profile in Scientific American, he honestly admitted the role of philosophical assumptions. He stated, People need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct you a spherical, symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. So what he's saying is what Dr. Russell Humphreys has come up with He's saying secular scientists could come up with it as well, and you can't disprove it. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds because they don't want a creator. What he is shown is sound science, but you can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. Next video, he'll talk about gravitational time dilation. Now, you know, time in the gravity well of the Earth differs depending upon whether you're at sea level, say a mile up in the mountains, and also out of space. So the time differs because of gravitation. And he gets into this. And he's using some of the quote that I showed from Edwin Hubble. unwelcome favorite location have to be avoided at all costs on the third day when god turned the waters into earth and there were no stars or planets yet no sun moon anything in genesis 1 9 he says let the waters below the heavens or below the expanse be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear so the waters that were below the expanse near the center are turned into the earth. God turns it into solid material. These waters that were above the expanse got pushed way out there above the highest star. So you see in the picture a globe. Uh, it's probably mostly ice particles now. Uh, very thin, uh, not anything thick, uh, but just a thin layer of, of water and ice particles. And uh, it has to be at least 24 billion light years in diameter because that's how far out we can see with our telescopes right now. At the start of the fourth day of creation, the Earth was the only stuff, the only matter below the waters. Uh, so it was a pretty empty universe below the waters. And that makes for an unusual gravity situation. Now, why should gravity matter? Scientists agree that gravity affects time. There's an effect called gravitational time dilation. It's in Einstein's general theory of relativity. And it says that the lower a clock is in altitude, the slower it ticks. Lower clocks tick slower. Now this was predicted by Einstein, but it's also been shown by experiment in a lot of different ways. Uh, atomic clocks at mountain altitudes tick five millionths of a second per year faster than clocks at sea level. And the effect isn't big for a one mile difference in altitude, but imagine what, how big the effect might be for a 14 billion light year difference in altitude. Practical examples that you're familiar with, the global positioning system needs to correct for gravitational time dilation those satellites need to know exactly what time it is or they'll misplace you and your car and not have you located well. So it has to be accounted for. My friend, Dr. John Hartnett in Australia, a physicist there, makes very precise atomic clocks. John's clocks are so precise that he can measure the gravitational time dilation difference in clock rate between something here and something one foot above it. The third example is uh, they took atomic clocks on an airline, several physicists, and they measured gravitational time dilation as well as several other kinds of time dilation. 
just due to the altitude. So the bottom line of all this is that in contrast to what you might think, clocks and time itself doesn't tick at the same rate at every different part of the universe. Okay, we're, this is the last video I'm going to show. It goes about seven minutes, but he'll talk about the gravitational time dilation using um, a, a trampoline. And I'm letting him explain it because he it d d does a better job than what I could try to come up with. So be patient. This will be the last video, and then we'll close. Oops. Starlight. Here, this video. Trampoline is a good analogy for gravity. If you make a two-dimensional slice of the waters above, they look like a ring. And those waters above are like a ring on the trampoline. So, and imagine it's a heavy ring. Uh, so it's weighing down, pressing down the trampoline, making a, a dent in it. Now notice also it's flat inside the ring. That means there's no gravity. If you put a little marble inside the ring, it's going to uh, not roll. There's no gravitational force inside the spherical arrangement of waters above. So, but outside the ring, uh, if you put a marble there, it's going to slide toward the ring. That's analogous to gravitational force. So a little mass makes a little dent. Uh, what about a really big mass like the waters above? Those waters above would make a really big dent. The water mass, that's the amount of water, the amount of stuff, uh, turns out to be 20 times all the mass in all the galaxies. And where do I get that? Um, it's from a study I made uh, of the Pioneer anomaly and the slowdown of some spacecraft. And it's in the Journal of Creation in August 2007. And so let's look at a cross section of this very trampoline with the deep depth cut out of it. And here's the point I'm getting to this starts the to get day, interesting. The you might want to pay close attention. A timeless level. And I'll explain what a timeless level is in a moment. But you so so you see a cross section of the trampoline here, and the vertical direction is gravitational energy, and the horizontal direction is distance away from the Earth. And uh, you see a point at the distance away from Earth, which is billions of light years drop down on uh, the dotted line and you see a little slice there that says uh, that's a section of the waters above that are making the dent and in the green the area is the earth so then you notice to the left of the waters above it's mostly flat except for a little tiny dent made by that green ball uh, at the left which is the earth that's right above a certain critical depth of gravitational energy where interesting things happen to time in Einstein's equations. So what happens to time is that below that critical level, there is no time. Time doesn't tick. You don't notice, you can't think, uh, and there is no light, so it's dark. Here I'm going to show you, begin to show you why uh, this effect is so important in cosmology. During the fourth day, God created the stars. Now, I'm going to suppose it's not necessary that God created the stars in a wave moving out from the earth on the fourth day of creation. So now let's go back to a cross section of our trampoline. Instead of looking down on it, let's look at the cross section again. And the point of this is that new star masses, the stars that God made, the new ones he made, dented the trampoline yet further. So there's a wave of new stars, and you notice the, the dent is now tilted down, and it's really deep near the Earth, and it's shallow, a little it's shallower at the waters down above. The increase in mass of the stars. Okay. Now we have a new scriptural effect to talk about, stretching out the heavens. God stretched the fabric of space. How do I know that? 17 verses that say things like this, God stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. That's Isaiah 40, 22. Imagine some big hands on our trampoline 
applying tension to the edges. So God stretched the fabric of space, and that would make the nearly flat region rise upward. So you can kind of imagine if you, if you stretch the trampoline, you're going to apply more force to that, that ring that's sitting, making the dent, and it's going to pull it up. So here we are starting uh, the action just after God has made the dent deeper with the stars, and now we're going to uh, apply stretching and pull up all of that up. So I want you to keep your eye on that vertical red arrow that's labeled event horizon. Things to the left of the event horizon are going to have no clocks ticking. They're going to be in the timeless zone. Things to the right of the event horizon in the uh, have zone. normal time. So you're going to watch as we stretch the fabric. Uh, we're going to raise the dent above that dotted line, and we're raising things above the timeless level. And you'll see the event horizon move to the left. And so as it moves to the left, more and more of the galaxies uh, pop out of the timeless zone and start emitting light again. You notice it moved inward all the way to the center. And the last thing that the event horizon hits is at distance zero, which is at the Earth. So the Earth is the last thing to actually uh, come above the event horizon. Uh, Remember, God made the new stars in a wave, and we're going to see that a timeless zone followed the new wave of stars. And then as stretching started pulling the dent out of the timeless zone, you're going to see the timeless zone here shrinking. Uh, so the Earth was the first into the timeless zone and the last out of the timeless zone. Let's give you a 3D picture. So starlight followed that shrinking zone of timelessness. I've made this timeless zone purple so you can see it better. It would really be black. Uh, and let's just see what this means. And so you see galaxies outside the zone and then more of them are going to appear as the timeless zone shrinks. And as it shrinks, light from those galaxies that popped out are going to follow that sphere inward until it disappears and the Earth sees that light. So notice that the Earth is the last thing to regain time. In other words, everything inside the black zone, time has been totally stopped. So Earth went into that zone to begin with, so its time stopped first, and then as the zone shrank back to Earth, the Earth was the last place in the universe to have its clock start ticking again. I'm saying, this is one theory, Earth time stopped at some moment during the fourth day of creation. If you'd been there, you wouldn't detect it. Uh, you wouldn't even notice it. Uh, but out in the distant galaxies, lots of time was elapsing. So immediately, sometime on the fourth day, uh, starlight would appear. So. Earth time stopped during the fourth day, and the fourth day was only 24 hours of time here. If you'd been there on the Earth at that point, uh, you would have experienced no time during that timeless moment. It would not even be an eye blink. You would be able to suddenly see all the stars all at once. So the age of the universe, when Adam saw it, was just six days EST, Earth Standard Time. So when someone asks you how old the universe is, you should ask, whose clocks are you talking about? The ones that God gave are here on Earth. He wanted Adam and Eve to be able to see our own Milky Way. Some parts of it are 50,000 light years away from us. And Andromeda, which is 2 million light years away from us. You can see it as a patch in the northern sky. Uh, he wanted Adam and Eve to see the full glory of his universe. So I think you can see that there are answers to these questions from a biblical point of view. So I want you to be able to trust the Bible to be true.
Okay. So distant starlight, not a problem for a young universe. Distant starlight relies on a whole series of assumptions. We went over several of them. Some are wrong and others are questionable. But challenging the assumptions, we are coming up with multiple possible solutions. Also, multiple possible creation cosmologies to investigate further how the Lord made the universe. The heavens did not declare there was a Big Bang 13.7 or 13.8 billion years ago. The heavens declare the glory of God, as in Psalm 19.1. The end. Any questions or comments?